sermon series on the whole armor of God. Um, I've kind of subtitled this series. Pastor Vance and I are sharing this series. Um, but I've entitled it Equipped and Deployed for Spiritual Warfare. And this is part two. Last week, uh, Pastor Vance did a great job of, of, uh, of disseminating the truth about the belt of truth. And today we're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. And I believe that this sermon could be the most important sermon that I've ever preached. For that reason, I need everybody to pay attention. Um, I'm, I want you to avoid walking out and going to the restroom in the middle of this because you need to hear this. This is a very important sermon. Young people, that means you too. If you guys need a Bible, if anybody needs a Bible, there's Bibles in the back back there. Please grab one. Um, you're welcome to borrow that while you're here today. The late theologian Francis Schaeffer was among the first uh, of, of many Christian leaders to refer to the United States as a post-Christian nation. Almost since its founding, America has been known as a Christian nation. But that's not the case any longer. Things are very different now than they were when our forefathers established this country. Obviously, things are different. But what I'm talking about are this, is the spiritual life of our nation. <clears throat> I grew up... Admittedly, I grew up in the 1950s and the 1960s, okay? I'm a little older than many of you in here. Um, and everybody at that time, even those who did not attend church, everybody had a general knowledge and understanding of the Bible. They knew what the Bible said. They knew the truths of the Bible. They knew the stories of the Bible. And, and, and I wouldn't say 100%, but a lot of of people in the United States, the majority of people in the United States then knew about the Bible. And, and if you were to describe a story in the Bible, they would have some working knowledge of that story. <clears throat> That's not the case today. Christianity has moved from a place of high honor to a place of general distrust in our nation. And this seems to be on the rise Christianity is being attacked publicly in ways never seen in our nation's history. Today, there are overt attempts to marginalize Christianity, to marginalize its meaning and its influence. In fact, in some cases, Christianity has been compared to the worst kind of terrorists. Folks actually say things like, if you strongly believe in the Bible, you're not any different than those who strongly believe in Islam to the point of doing bad things to people for that cause. So we've been compared to those who spew hate and seek to do harm. And our biblical teachings, the same ones upon which our nation were founded, are now maligned and called narrow-minded and bigoted by many people in our country today. If you look around, even here, you look around and churches are empty because people find Christianity not to be something that speaks to their life and their need right now. When Christians attempt to hold firmly to biblical truths, even when those truths are spoken in love, we're often referred to as hate-filled. Dr. D. James Kennedy was the author of something called Evangelism Explosion in the 1970s. <clears throat> and he talks about a survey that he conducted in which Christians were asked the top three reasons why they don't share their faith. And he thought, as he before he asked this question, he thought the top three reasons would be, number one, fear. 
Number two, lack of training. And number three, a lack of exposure to non-Christians. <clears throat> but to his surprise, the number one reason that Christians gave for not sharing their faith, are you ready for this? It's because of the life that they live. They didn't think it was right for them to talk about believing in Christ when they weren't living for Christ themselves. But this perfectly illustrates why we need to have, why we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I've asked my brother to come and help me, so I'm going to say what we used to say in the Army, demonstrate a post. <clears throat> This is my brother Josiah. He is a soldier in the United States Army, and he, I asked him to bring in uh, the modern-day version of a breastplate so we could see what it looks like. The breastplate that was worn by the Roman soldiers, of which um, the Apostle Paul referred in Ephesians, covered much of the same area that soldiers, the protection that soldiers have today. All of the vital organs except the brain are covered by this armored plating. Okay? And so the soldiers on today's battlefield and the soldiers in Roman times um, had the same kind of protection. It covered all of the torso from the neck down into the groin area because they knew that if an arrow came into the heart or into the lungs or into the stomach or a sword was thrust into any of these areas, that it meant certain death for them. Today, we're not so much worried about arrows and swords, but we are worried about uh, 4.62 rounds and things like that, <laughs> okay, for our soldiers. Amen? And, uh, and bombs going off in the vicinity, roadside bombs and IEDs. And so this armor plating that's here, not only in the front, but also, turn around, in the back, it's also in the back as well, protects those vital organs, okay? And I will tell you that this is one of the most important pieces of equipment that a soldier will put on today. But I would also tell you that it's one of the most important pieces of equipment that Christians need to put on today. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Give it my round of applause. <laughs> the breastplate of righteousness communicates, I think, for us four symbolic messages for each one of us who believes in Jesus. The first one of these is the breastplate symbolizes Christ's righteousness. You need to understand this. When we put on the full armor of God, we're putting on Jesus Christ. We are putting on Jesus Christ, just as He is truth, as we learned last week, He is also our righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Paul, I believe, is referring to the second of two things that happened on the cross. First of all, Jesus took our place by taking all of our sin, all of our sin, all of our sin upon himself. Second, for those who believe in him and receive this sacrifice that he made on the cross, he imparts to us his righteousness. He is our righteousness. You need to understand that. He is our righteousness. The reason God no longer holds our sins against us but views us as his righteous, redeemed children is because we are covered by the blood of Christ and by his righteousness. Amen. It's because of what Christ did on the cross that Paul would write to the Philippian church in, in Philippians 3.9 saying this, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on on faith. In short, a Christian is a person to whom the righteousness of Christ has been credited. I like the way Romans 5.19 puts it. It says this, For as by one man's disobedience, that one man was Adam, 
The many were made sinners, so by one's man, one man's obedience, Jesus, the many, will be made righteous. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, and this is, again, I think, has become one of my most favorite, favorite passages of Scripture. For God asked, for God's sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. So when you put on the breastplate of righteousness through faith in Christ, it symbolizes that you are protected by the righteousness of Christ. You might ask, well, well that's good, but what am I protected from? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You're protected from the accusations of Satan before God about your sin, about your faithless life, about your faults, and your lack of commitment. Listen, remember, Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. He accuses us of being unworthy. He accuses us of being unworthy, but you need to hear this. Everybody look up here. Positionally, if you are a Christian, positionally, you are in Christ, and because you're in Christ, you are declared righteous. So you may ask, well, if God makes us righteous, do we really have to worry about the way we live? Does it really matter if we put on this breastplate of righteousness? Paul answered that question in Romans 6, 1 and 2. He said this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, God forbid, or by no means. That's precisely why we wear the breastplate of righteousness. We who have been saved and made righteous by God's grace must daily choose, listen to me, must daily choose to make righteous choices. God gave us his armor so that we can live the way he expects us to live. Just like Jesus lived. So that takes us to the second point in this sermon. The breastplate also symbolizes the Christian's righteousness. Now that's different than Christ's righteousness, and I'll explain that here in just a minute. But the Christian's righteousness, we see in, verse, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ became not only our righteousness, but also our sanctification. Now, sanctification is a big word. That's a big theological word. But what it really means is that we become in practice what we are positionally. So because Jesus Christ died on the cross and we've accepted him, positionally we are righteous. We take on his righteousness. But we also need to practically become righteous. That's what sanctification is, moving us from where we are the moment we're saved to where God wants us to be through our lifetime. It is a process. It is something that is continuous. No Christian has ever arrived. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the, of the New Testament, much of the New Testament, admitted at the end of his life that I have not already obtained it yet. I'm still striving. I'm still leaning forward in the foxhole, if you will. I'm still working towards that end. None of us will ever get there this side of heaven, but that is the direction we need to be moving in our Christian lives. We must become actually more righteous instead of just positionally righteous in a legal sense. So the breastplate symbolizes the Christian's, listen, the breastplate symbolizes the Christian's ability to withstand the temptations of Satan to sin and actually to become righteous, holy, set apart, a holy set-apart person of God. You see, positional righteousness is not all that we need in spiritual warfare. We need that. We need it absolutely. But we also need practical righteousness as well. Apart from your righteousness positionally in Christ and practically in life, you have no defense against Satan. He can feed you lie after lie. And if you're not dressed in the breastplate of righteousness, you have, listen to this, you have no authority over Satan. You have no authority to resist him. Here's why I said this sermon may be the most important sermon that you will ever hear. People who say they cannot witness for Christ because their own life doesn't 
give an example of a Christian. Listen to this. Satan has convinced them that they are hypocrites for living like they do while wanting to tell others about Jesus. Without the breastplate of righteousness positionally and practically, Satan is absolutely right. But stay with me. Don't, 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 don't check out yet. Stay with me, okay? It's only when we have been granted righteousness in spite of our sins, because remember, Christ took our sins upon himself on the cross, okay? That we can say to Satan then, I'm not telling people about Jesus because I'm perfect, but because Jesus Christ is perfect. He has forgiven all the things that would make me look like a hypocrite. Paul used the example of this from his own life to explain it. 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 10. And I'm not going to read that whole thing, but in verse 4, Paul says that he can commend himself as a servant of God because he has, in verse 7, put up verse 7 if you will, Paula, because he has the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Listen, as often as Satan tried to attack and to derail Paul and his ministry through persecutions, through hardships, and, and, and he had a ton of them. You can go and read the Bible and, and pack in those pass that passage alone, 3 through 10. You can find all kinds of, of different things that Paul had to go through. But listen, Paul was never, ever defeated because he was clothed with the armor of righteousness. Listen. The unrighteous Christian life is a powerless Christian life. Let me say that again. The unrighteous Christian life is a powerless Christian life. It is powerless because it's based on a guilty conscience loaded down with shame and guilt. Hear this. A man who is conscious of being in the wrong is usually a coward. But a man who knows that he is right can withstand a multitude. And so he enters the conflict without fear. If you're opposed and condemned by those who oppose Christ and his gospel, and that includes Satan and all of his uh, demons, only righteousness, positional righteousness, and practical righteousness can give you a reason to stand firm. The breastplate of righteousness is not only a symbol of Christ's righteousness given to you, but it is His righteousness expressed, listen to this, it's expressed through your life on a daily basis. One more thing, and you need to hear this loud and clear today. Satan is a defeated foe. Yes. The only power, listen to this, the only power that he has over you is the power that you give to him Whenever you're tempted and you give in to the temptation, what you are saying in essence to Satan at that point when you give in to the temptation is, Satan, I know that you have no power over me, but because you're tempting me, I'm going to give you a little bit of power by giving in to that temptation. The only way that you can let Satan have power over you is to, is to willingly give it to him by giving in to the temptations that he places before you. Listen, Jesus was tempted. In the wilderness. He had been in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. He had not had anything to eat or drink for, for during that whole time. And then Satan came to tempt him. And the first thing he did was tempt him with food. You know, when you haven't had anything to eat for 40 days and 40 nights, and you, you, you're you going to be hungry, not hungry, hungry. All right, brother? You ever been hungry before? That's way beyond hungry. That's hungry. That's where, you're, where your stomach's talking to you more than your mind is talking to you. Jesus was hungry. And Satan said, look, you, you know, you, all you've got to do is just turn those stones into bread. You can eat anything you want. You can have anything you want. Jesus could have given Satan power right then. I said, you know, you're right. I agree with you. When we agree with Satan, we give Satan the power to overcome us. But we have the power to overcome him by resisting that temptation. And every time we do, guess what? His power is weaker and weaker and weaker against us. And you know what? We are creatures. Listen to me. We are creatures of habit. Okay? So the more that we resist the temptation, the easier it is to resist the temptation. 
But if we give in to the temptation every time it appears, every time it raises its ugly head in our lives, then guess what? Then we become weaker and weaker against that temptation. So it's really a conscious decision that you need to make. That you can say, I am not going to give in to that temptation. Yes, it may be something that looks enticing to me. It looks exciting to me. But I am not going to give in to it because I'm not going to give Satan any room in my life whatsoever. You have the power to deny Satan his power. But if you give in to the temptation, then Satan wins. And he has power over you. The choice is yours. James 4, 7 tells us that if we resist Satan, he will flee from you. You see, he's all talk. He's all talk anyway. If you resist him, he will flee from you. How do we resist? First of all, we, wear it, we, we do it by wearing the breastplate of righteousness. And that means that we're thinking properly. It helps us to know the difference between right and wrong. We need to understand the, the difference between right and wrong. And wearing the blessed breastplate of righteousness means that then, once we know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, that we choose to do right. Yes. It helps us engage in right thinking. Yes. Wearing the breastplate of righteousness means that sometimes we have to turn and run away from the temptation. We have to flee the temptation. One of the most often misunderstood verses in the Bible I, I, I'm, I'm going to go so far as to say the most misunderstood verse in the Bible, or, or maybe not the most misunderstood, but the most misquoted verse in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'm going to ask her to put that up there. But I'm going to tell you what I often hear people say. You know, the Bible tells us that God won't put more on us than we can handle. I want you to read that verse and tell me if that's what it says. Because that's not what that verse says to me. He says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be, what? Tempted beyond your ability. Okay? But with the temptation, is there another verse? With the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Okay, that's what the verse says. So if you've been out there telling people all over the place, you know God's not going to put more on you than you can handle. He might put more on you than you can handle. But you know what? You may be tempted, but if you, God's never going to allow temptation to come into your life without providing a way of escape. And you know how you can escape the temptation? When you see Satan coming at you with that temptation, you can say, get thee behind me, Satan, and then you can turn and go the other way. Because if you resist, listen, this is what happens, though. Okay, this is what often happens. Too often we linger around the temptation. We kind of we kind of circle the temptation a little bit. You know, we want to get close enough to the sin to to to, to dip our finger in and taste it a little bit. You know, to see what it's like. All the while hoping that we won't give in to the temptation, and then we wonder why we fail, and we wonder why we fall because we want to hang out with the temptation. You know, a a a, a fellow that's that's a member of our church who's doing great work through Alcoholics Anonymous is a guy by the name of Nathan Bradley. And, uh, and he told me that, that, I mean, he was a flaming alcoholic. Let me tell you what Nathan did. Nathan used to drink a fifth of whiskey on his way to work. He, lived, he, he, he lives in Clarksville. He works in Ashland City. And he used to stop by the liquor store on the way to work and get a fifth of whiskey, and it would be gone before he got to work. And then on his way home, he'd pick up not a six-pack of beer, but a case of beer and another fifth of whiskey, and it'd be gone before he went to bed that night. He was a functioning alcoholic. And I will tell you that one day he realized that he was on his way south. And I'm not talking about Dixie. I'm talking about hell. And he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he got cleaned up. And he no longer is tempted by alcohol. But you know what? He doesn't go and hang out in bars. He doesn't go and hang out in places where alcohol is being served because he knows that that temptation is always there. Yes, he has victory over that sin in his life, but he doesn't go to the places where people hang out and do the stuff that he used to do. He avoids it because he knows that those aren't the places that you're going to be able to escape easily from. There aren't a lot of back doors. 
and bars. Okay? Sometimes we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness and then we need to flee. Remember I had him turn around and point to the, to the armor plating on the back? It'll protect you that way as you're running away from the enemy just as well as it will if you stand and fight the enemy. Okay? The third thing I want you to see in this is the breastplate symbolizes consistent righteousness. We're, we're coming around the bend here. Righteousness is not a Sunday only requirement. What do I mean by that? It's not self-righteousness. Okay? In other words, it's not something we parade around piously with on Sunday or, or some other times when we are around other Christians uh, and, and then the rest of the time we live our lives like we don't know Christ at all, like we're an atheist. We have to be consistent in wearing the breastplate of righteousness as well. The moment that we decide to take off the breastplate is at that very moment that Satan is looking for. He's looking for an opportunity to gain an inroads or a foothold in your life. So we must live out the spiritual realities that we present on Sunday morning when we show up with our spiritual vest on every day of the week. Our life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday night and Friday and Saturday evening needs to look the same as it does on Sunday. If we don't, then we're like those who are afraid to share the gospel because of the quality of their spiritual life. Listen, Paul's practical way, practical way of illustrating this is, is, is to say, and Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 tells us this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And in 27 it says, Give no opportunity to the devil. Listen. Satan knows when you and I are living our lives unrighteously. When our conscience is conflicted or unclear, when we cannot stand firm because we have secret sins in our lives, when we have taken off the breastplate of righteousness. Inconsistent righteousness is an invitation to be attacked spiritually. Let me say that again. Inconsistent righteousness is an invitation to to be attacked spiritually. The fourth thing I want you to see as we, as we conclude this is the breastplate symbolizes controlled righteousness. Remember I talked about making a habit of resisting sin? And the more we do it, the easier it is to do it. When we make a habit of living righteously, when we cultivate righteousness, we won't ever have to stop and decide which way to go at every crossroads that we encounter. We won't have, we're not always confronted with those decisions because we are living a consistent Christian life. But if we're still having the same internal discussions, that self-talk, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you know that really looks good. No, you know better. You know, it's kind of like those old cartoons where you had, you had a, little, a little demon on one side, a little angel on the other, and you, and you can't decide which one you want to listen to, you know? If you're having those same kind of internal discussions on matters of what's right and what's wrong, what's righteous and what's unrighteous, what is sin and what's not sin, that we had when we were brand new Christians, then something is wrong. We are to live a life under the control. Listen to this. We are to live a life under the control of the Holy Spirit who will shape and direct our lives, as Psalm 23.3 says, in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Amen. The secret to a controlled, righteous life is not to work or to try harder. The Apostle Paul tried that with utter failure. As he describes in Romans 7.15 and 19, he says this, for for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And then in verse 19 he says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He found that he was unable in his own strength and in his own resources to do the right thing. You Listen, the opposite of self-effort is to let go and let God. The opposite of self-effort, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to work harder. No, that's not how you do it. Listen, folks, you've got to let go, you've got to release it, and let God have it. Come on, brother, I'm going to do this. I've done it before, we've got a lot of new folks here that had not seen it. You know, we say, 
God, I, I, I want you to take away this temptation. I really do. Take it away, God. Here it is. I really, I really want you to take it away, God. Come on, take it. Oh, God, please, why aren't you taking it away, God? Come on. Come on, God, take it. You see, we got to learn to let go and let God have it. You see what I'm talking about? we got to learn to do that. Listen, I am to do nothing. I am to do nothing but wait on God. Because when we wait on God, then God takes control of our lives. Think about what the breastplate covers. First and foremost, what does the breastplate cover? It covers the heart. Yes. Okay? Police today, if you've ever seen a policeman in a store or in a restaurant in his uniform, he, he kind of looks like he's really buff or really kind of bulky. It's because he's got on that armor-plated vest underneath his shirt. Okay? And military personnel, like we saw up here today, wear these vests, these, these armor-plated vests, for the same reasons that Roman soldiers wore them, and that is to protect their heart. Listen, spiritually, the heart is the seat of the emotions and affections. We don't say, I love you with all my mind, do we? <laughs> when we're talking to our sweetheart, I love you with all my mind. I love you so intellectually. No, what do we say? We say, I love you with all of my heart. Why? Because the heart is, is, is where the seat of the emotion is. We're not talking about our blood pumping muscle. I love you with all of my left and right ventricle. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the seat of our emotions with all that is. It's, it's, it's a description of who we are inside. Okay? The key to walking in the righteousness of Christ is to fall in love again with Jesus. And remain in love with Jesus. Instead of trying to live better, are you ready for this? Instead of trying to live better, we've got to learn to love better. The more deeply our heart is in love with Christ and following after Christ, the more that righteousness will characterize our conduct and our character. We've got to learn to love Jesus. You know, the Bible describes it as our first love. We've got to get back to that. We've got to stay there, you know? It isn't like the marriage where they've been married for 20 years and the wife says, you never tell me you love me anymore. And he says, listen, I told you I love you the day we married and if it changes, I'll let you know. No, we've got to hear it every single day. We've got to let God know that we love Him. And how do we let someone know that we love Him? Talk is cheap. Roses are nice. Candy's good. Nice candle at dinner is good. Seriously, how do we know, how does God know that we love Him? By obeying Him, by following His Word. But how do we know that? We can't get it by simply saying, boy, that's a nice looking Bible, you know. Uh, I'm going to stick it under my pillow tonight, and I'm going to lay on it, and I'm going to hope that some of that, maybe I'm going to put my head under it. So maybe, maybe some of that will seep down into my brain. No, we've got to open it. We've got to read it. We've got to know what it says in there. Right? We've got we to gotta, we gotta hide it in our heart. Listen, if, you're, if your sweetheart tells you something sweet, you don't say, you know, you told me something sweet the other day. I can't remember what it is. No, you got it. It's in there. You know when you said, you know, man, you're the best looking woman I ever saw. You remember when you told me that? I had never forgot that. You know, God loves you with an everlasting love. Don't you ever forget that. Yes, say that. So, I'm sorry, I get a little carried away here. I apologize. I miss, miss being out of the pulpit a week. So I, I'm, I'm giving you the whole load here. I'm sorry. So, the four aspects of righteousness is Christ's righteousness. That's the first one. Breastplate of righteousness is Christ's righteousness. The second one is our righteousness, the Christian's righteousness. The third thing is consistent righteousness and controlled righteousness. All are part of the breastplate of righteousness. And listen, when this breastplate is in place, your heart will be well protected against the fiery darts of the evil one. With one.